This panel, um, the third panel, is called Performing Environments. And I believe, as it says in the, on the uh, description, that we will be hearing about performance and uh, the notion of environment in the broadest sense. So I think we truly have a diverse um, set of speakers here who will be addressing these topics um, from different perspectives. Um, our panel, unlike some of the others, does not require you to be from Austria or to know how to sail. <laughs> we require instead <laughs> some form of affiliation with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <laughs> um, that's our little inside joke. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists, um, beginning with Michelle Addington, who is here um, closest to me. Um, Michelle Addington currently holds the position of Heinz Professor in Sustainable Architectural Design at Yale University. Uh, prior to teaching at Yale, Ms. Addington taught at Harvard University for 10 years. Um, her background includes work at NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, where she developed structural data for composite materials and designed components for unmanned spacecraft. Ms. Addington then spent a decade as a process design and power plant engineer, as well as a manufacturing supervisor at DuPont. After studying architecture, she was an architectural associate at a firm based in Philadelphia. She researches discrete systems and technology transfer and serves as an advisor on energy and sustainability for many organizations, including the Department of Energy and the AIA. Her chapters and articles on energy, environmental systems, lighting, and materials have appeared in many books, uh, one of which I had the pleasure to, to uh, co-contribute to, a volume called Soft Space by Rutledge, um, and journals. And she recently co-authored Smart Materials and Technologies for uh, the Architecture and Design Professions. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce all three, as, sorry. Um, and <laughs> Mike uh, Lepic. Uh, Professor Lepic's research focuses on the integration of sustainability indicators into engineering design, ranging from materials design, structural design, system design, to operations management. Such sustainability indicators include a comprehensive set of environmental, economic, and social costs. Recently, his research has focused on the design of sustainable, high-performance, fiber-reinforced cementitious composites, <laughs> um, with a very long acronym, fiber-reinforced polymers, the impacts of sustainable materials on building and infrastructure for building systems, transportation systems, uh, water systems, consumer products. Along with this, he is studying the effects that uh, slowly diffusing sustainable civil engineering innovations and the social networks they diffuse through can have on achieving long-term sustainability goals. Uh, Michael joined the Stanford University Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering faculty from the University of Michigan's Center for Sustainable Systems, where he was a research fellow at the School of Natural Resources and Environment. He received his PhD in Materials Engineering from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. He also received his MSE in Structural Engineering from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. Oh, sorry. Um, um, and his industry experience lies in the design and construction of interstate highways and bridges and the construction of residential high rises in seismic zones. So um, that's Mike. And our third speaker, Tom Wiscombe, a pleasure um, as a co-member of the faculty here and a good friend. Um, Tom Wiscombe is an architectural designer based in Los Angeles. Uh, he founded Emergent, his firm, in 1999 after completing his master's degree at UCLA. Emergent's primary directive is to move beyond categorical thinking and the stratification of building systems toward a more integrated future. This involves a re-examination of assumed hierarchies and discreteness of systems toward coherent yet heterogeneous organizations. Emergent is particularly interested in how the different features and behaviors of structure, environmental systems, envelope, and lighting can be negotiated to produce emergent formal spatial and atmospheric effects. Tom was previously a senior designer and project design partner at Co-op Himmelblau for over 10 years, um, right hand to Principal Wolf Priggs. He was in charge of various internationally renowned projects, including the Dresden UFA um, 
Cinema Place, the Lyon Musée de Confluence, and the Akron Art Museum. Most notably, Wiscombe was senior designer for BMW, BMW, BMW uh, World Munich, which has been hailed as one of the most important buildings uh, in the 21st century. Um, and Tom <laughs> began his career as an intern at NASA, <laughs> Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, in the Atmospheric Science Department, um, where his father is a chief scientist. And Tom's recently uh, been awarded first prize for two very large projects uh, for the Chinese National Games. So we're very excited to see those uh, hopefully come to completion. Okay, thank you. We'll start with Michelle. <coughs> So I hate to go back into the past and, and show something that probably uh, predates the birth of most of the people in here, but it was my introduction to composite materials, and so I, I felt like it was a good way for me to, to kick this off. Um, this was the uh, International Sun-Earth Explorer uh, mission that was my second project while I was working at NASA. What was really interesting about this particular project is that it was the first time that we used finite element analysis in order to study the behavior of these two spacecraft. It's two different spacecraft. One uh, we built, and the second one was, was built by the European Space Research Organization. And the reason why we had to use some type of numerical analysis or computational analysis was simply we did not have the other satellite uh, in, our, in our hands. And what had happened previous to that is most of the testing was destructive. You know, full test units would be built, uh, they'd be put into chambers, they'd be shaken to death, and then you'd, an iterative process would go forward. And of course, this is a process that not only was enormously expensive, it became a point that it was no longer practical. Uh, so I was part of the team there that developed NASTRAN, uh, which is uh, the first and probably the, the godfather of all of the structural analysis programs that people use here. Um, just to show you what some of those models look like, and, and, and it, those of you who do structural analysis would probably be a little shocked to see this. This is two complete spacecraft, a coupling, all of it modeled with only 182 points and a total of 45 degrees of freedom. You probably wouldn't model even one strut uh, with as little uh, as that now. But back then, that's all we could do. You know, computational systems were so very slow. Uh, this was still in its infancy. We really didn't know uh, really how to develop it. We did a lot of the calculations by hand. And I think one of the great learning experiences for me from this, and this is, I was very young at the time, so it was really with the senior engineers that I was working with, is that if you really, really do understand your phenomena, you understand the governing equations, you know, you can operate and actually get very, very good results, even with just having a few things fixed. And so, for example, you know, we only had one kind of element that we could model. It was a, a cylindrical cross-section. Uh, it was a rod. And you know, we had to, none of our cross sections were rods. We actually had to sort of jerry-rig a lot of the performance data in order to deal with these unusual cross sections. Nevertheless, this type of analysis was enough uh, that we could really move forward. So while I was working on this project, and I, I, I don't recall the company, and I, it, it may well be one that uh, uh, was sort of a forebear to some of the companies that are here today, but a company asked if they could come in and introduce some composite materials for us. And I was really surprised after Marcelo asked if I would do this. I was trying to remember my composite materials background, and I found this book. Um, it's been in a box since 1994, which was also almost 20 years after I had packed it uh, away. And uh, I pulled this back out, but we were given this small little course on composite materials. This is the book that uh, four of us were handled, handed, and we were also given a little piece of graphite epoxy that really looked like it had been made, you know, in a toilet bowl in, in somebody's, you know, home. It was just a sort of little piece, really, of crap. And so uh, just to go into this book and to see about what the level 
of the knowledge was at that time period. Here's two of the images from the book. You know, so looking at what a cross-section of the graphite epoxy would be up there, and then even looking at the test apparatus here, that the way they, they understood the performance data or the, the properties was actually by drawing on the material and then having these little chains uh, that they pulled it apart on. That's how a lot of that information was collected. And so we were asked if we could consider, you know, start, starting to use this particular material. And this is something that, you know, was, was really quite problematic. You know, we not only know experience with the material, uh, you know, this is the kind of property information we had, the type of reliability. We also didn't have a form that it came in. And I think this is something that's really, uh, really quite profound as we start to think about whether or not you know, form is a priori to how you move forward with all of this. So if you think about performance, we had four basic criteria. You know, whatever we made had to be very, very light. Uh, it had to withstand enormous forces during launch. Uh, once it was in orbit, it had to be able to deploy you know, very, very delicate instruments with incredible precision and maintain them in very particular, very, very, very specific uh, uh, dimensions and very specific locations for a fairly long period of time. And then perhaps the worst thing uh, beyond the, the, the launch loads was that you would have this enormous temperature difference given the fact that part of it might be facing the sun and part of it would be spacing deep space. So even within an inch, or two of material, you might see a couple of hundred degrees difference on it. So four really quite extreme performance uh, specifications that one had to address. And yet if we think about performance in materials, we think about performance in architecture, you know, we don't normally think about performance as being that disconnected or that far down the road from the thing that we make. We tend to have a much more direct or one-to-one -one relationship between the performance criteria that we're interested in and what we wanted to do. And that was the dilemma for us with these composite materials because there was no stable ground, there was no frame of reference that we could refer back to. Did we want it to behave like titanium and look like titanium? That was probably not something we wanted to do. But what should it do? What should it look like? What should the form be? What would be the performance criteria at the, that sort of like the direct or composite or the micro level that would give us these sort of very large performance criteria at the, at the gross level? And you know, was, we were just caught in a circular trap of not really knowing how to go forward with this material that didn't come to us in any kind of given set of shapes or different, given type of components. And I would say that after working on this for a while, um, I pretty much decided I hated structures, I hated structural analysis, and I hated materials. And I left, uh, left DuPont, I mean, left NASA at this point so I could do heat transfer and, and fluid mechanics at DuPont, which I did for many years. So, you know, feed forward 20 years uh, from then uh, after I left NASA, and uh, I was just starting to teach at the GSD when I was asked, and I guess because I had the mechanical engineering background, it was assumed that I really did like materials. And so I was asked to teach a course or develop a course in smart materials. Uh, this is really, really early on, uh, certainly in the architecture world for something like smart materials. I think, and I, I may well be wrong, I think it was the first course um, that was offered in the School of Architecture that dealt with this, this is back in 1996. Uh, and at the time, we had no materials to work with. You know, we had, um, uh, I had some color changing Play-Doh uh, that I found uh, in, a, in a toy store. Um, I had a sample of a photochromic material and uh, because I did have a background in, in uh, piezoelectrics, I actually had some of those left over uh, from my DuPont days. And that was it and we formed a whole course out of this. This is what uh, Dan Shodek, the wonderful uh, structures professor, I think most people use his structures book. But in developing that, the approach was really quite different than the approach uh, that I began with or sort of was introduced to materials, you know, 20 years before then. And because I had now was approaching it from the standpoint of being from fluid mechanics and heat transfer and not from the, the standpoint of being a structural material, I started to look at the material as sort of not having a sort of set of very basic, basic properties, measurable properties, 
much more interested not in sort of the things that were measured, but in actually how they behaved and, and what behaved. And that's sort of the difference in these types of materials is that we care how they, they behave, what they do, really don't care what they are, uh, really don't even care, in, in this case, of what they look like. And so there's this little model that I set up uh, for the students, basically that any material uh, can be described by the relationship at the top that whatever energy you put into it is going to cause some kind of change in state of the material, and a material property tends to be tends to scale that that relationship. And so I set up uh, this for all of the different classes uh, of smart materials. So for a traditional mechanical material, and I mean high performance as well, that that material property is just a, pr a constant of proportionality. Hooke's law, you know, we see Young's modulus is that constant of proportionality. Fourier's law, it's just conductivity. So in setting it up for all of these different materials, again, here's the uh, looking at this now uh, from the standpoint of what, what is sort of the, the driver, what is the result. Uh, so the state of the object for a traditional material, it's a function of the amount of energy uh, that you transfer into it. The property is constant. Uh, for what I termed uh, the first class of smart materials, there the property was a function of the state of the object, and we, you know, something like a thermochromic, uh, where the temperature of the object affects uh, its spectral uh, reflectivity. Uh, smart material two is where the property is actually a function of the amount of energy that you put into the project. That would be something like an electrochromic. The smart material three, where the energy, energy type that is output is a function of the amount of energy that goes in. Uh, the electrically activated polymer that we saw in the first talk um, today uh, is in this category. And then the, the fourth category, which has to do with the change in the internal energy, something that would give you a, a shape memory alloy. And so in setting these up, the intention of doing it in this fashion was to present these materials as materials of motion, of materials of action, but primarily as materials that were thermodynamic. So again, not structural from that standpoint, but actually thermodynamic. And that's why all of this is set up in terms of being about energy movement and, and about being about state. So what is interesting about all of this is if you think about this functional functionality that you move across on, is that you can pretty much map anything. No matter what you want is your input, no matter what you want is your output, there is a material that will do that. You simply have to be able to define which of these changes that you're interested in, was it, what, what type of energy input you have, what type of energy output you want, what state change you might be dealing with, what property change you might be interested in. Every one of these maps that you can take, and again, many, many more on there, there is a material that will map across like that. The question doesn't become, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, what material is it, it really comes from the standpoint is knowing what do you want it to do. And that ends up being the question that foregrounds much more so uh, than the material itself. And so you look at something like a privacy screen, and one can manipulate any one of these six basic behaviors of light to get exactly the same result. You know, you can do it by working on transmission, you can do it by working on refraction, uh, you can manipulate the spectrum, you can deal with diffusion. All of those will give you a privacy screen, and all of them can give you a privacy screen that looks somewhat like this, uh, the Lumisti film. Any one of these materials, you know, will manipulate at least one of those types of behaviors, and any one of these products can use any one of those materials or any one of those behaviors in order to, or order to do what they, they um, in order to do what they need to have done. What's very interesting about this as a mapping, as a set of relationships, is the fact that naming the material no longer names its properties. It no longer names what it can do. The material itself is actually quite backgrounded rather than foregrounded. And in essence, the material is simply instrumental. One has to be able to define the behavior, uh, and that becomes what moves to the foreground on that. The next thing that emerges when one starts looking at these kinds of materials is that we often think about our materials in geometric scale, or certainly our approach in geometric scale, because that's how we deal with our form. 
none of these materials really adhere to rules of geometric scale. What they adhere to are rules of dynamic similitude, which means they're looking at forces or balancing of forces. So for example, if you look at the kind of scales that are relevant to materials, and again, because all of these are thermodynamic materials, you know, these are the kinds of, of heat transfer modes we're interested in, what we find is that none of these have a governing scale that we can see. So whether we're dealing with light, uh, whether we're dealing with the movement of heat, uh, the only thing that comes close to, to operating at building scale is sound. All of the other phenomena are actually governed at scales much, much smaller than what we can see. And that is this sort of incredible disconnect between the things that we make and then the way that they actually behave. And so, you know, as sort of a basic example of this, you know, we think about daylighting design, and one of the very common approaches on daylighting design is just to assume you need glazing, uh, and glazing uh, preferably on a side that's receiving light. One minute, okay. Um, we can get all of the same amount of light on the north side of the facade by using a refraction film. Now that's still looking at things in terms of, of uh, building scale. And I'm just going to very quickly show you two projects which take the same phenomenon and actually stretch it out all the way from uh, what happens on the retina all the way to the city. Uh, the first one deals with urban heat island. Uh, the traditional approach to urban heat island and the standard uh, accepted uh, 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 the, the accepted approach is that if you want to prevent the enhanced urban heat island effect, your buildings have to be twice as far apart as they are high. That's addressing it through form, and actually that's something that is, is very well accepted. However, this is something that too is also a micron scaled phenomenon. And what the research of, of this particular woman, uh, Nari Fenyawatana, uh, discovered is that you can move the buildings or you can move the radiation, and you can move the radiation with a basic invisible coating that goes on the upper floor of a building. You can do exactly the same thing as moving uh, the buildings by just operating at that micron scale. Uh, by the same token, um, this is an interesting sort of coming full cycle. Uh, this is another one of my students who uh, was developing a smart paint. Uh, and this smart paint ended up, uh, the postdoc work was done at NASA, which I found, you know, just sort of uh, very, very fulfilling in many ways. Uh, but the way it was designed, it was that it was looking at exactly how a particular wavelength uh, reflected off of this paint and where it hit, not even that it hit the eye, but where it hit in the retina and how one controlled that. They worked together. They shared the, the urban heat island woman and the, um, uh, the, the one that was dealing with light on the retina worked together and shared much of the same research because the fundamental physics were the same. Uh, last piece of this is instead of thinking about material, thinking about phenomenon. Um, I've always loved uh, this particular uh, exhibit that Frederick Wilson, who, who unfortunately died last year, put together. Uh, he introduced me to, to magic, and, and uh, one of the years that I taught smart materials, uh, we looked at an awful lot of magic tricks, but magic tricks from the standpoint of how one produces phenomenon. This is my favorite of all of those. It's the blow book, uh, the one that magicians would uh, flip through the pages, show that they're blank, blow on them, flip through the pages, and continue to blow on. This is a, a version made by Ricky Jay. And what I find interesting about that is that, you know, we think today about a thermochromic material, which is what this was a precursor for, uh, the fact that heat would, will change, you know, what the image is. But the interesting thing about the blow book is that it wasn't about the material, it was about the effect. And so whatever means could be instrumentalized in creating the effect was what, what mattered. And I feel as though now we've become absolutely enamored with the material and what we can do with the material rather than working from the effect and how we might design with the effect. And I will just very quickly end with that. Uh, when I think about working with effect, what I'm most interested in is that our insertion, and particularly our material insertion, comes in the middle. 
uh, that whatever we choose from material, we're going to use it to somehow manipulate some physical phenomena. Our interest in manipulating that physical phenomena is actually to interact uh, with the human body. And so we start with physical phenomena, we end up with perception, but our action takes place somewhere in between. And I will stop right now. Thank you. All right. So. Um uh, when Marcelo asked me to come and present, I was kind of thinking, what in the world is a civil engineer going to talk to a bunch of architects about, and what in the world would I have a value to say to you about composites? And so I, I thought a bit about this and decided that what I really wanted to focus on was a couple of case studies uh, that looked at the way in which composites could be used in a couple of dual roles, and how as designers, engineers, architects, whatever it might be, uh, the way we use materials uh, can, be, can be very different depending on the circumstances in which they're used. Um, being an engineering professor, you're going to get outlines and a lot of things like this. So uh, We're going to start with the dual role of advanced materials. So if we look at the life cycle of most buildings, in this case it's a residence, uh, you can see that the energy that goes into constructing a building, uh, mining the materials, producing the materials that go into the building itself is a very small piece at this point. Uh, really the gorilla in the room is the, the use phase, the energy that's used to heat and light the building, the plug loads, all those things, and then demolition of end, and end of life is essentially uh, nothing. Uh, and so the lesson you learn from this graph here is that anything you do to reduce the use phase energy is very important. That's the first role of the use of advanced materials. In this case, we'll, get, we'll look at a couple of composites. But then on the other side of the uh, slide, we see that the, uh, the use phase energy uh, can be broken down into natural gas, electricity, and then a very small amount that's used to produce the materials that go into the use phase. Over the next 40 to 50 years, certainly within the lifetime of most of the buildings we design, we're going to see a shift in the way we produce energy in the United States and around the world, shifting to, uh, to much more uh, less intensive production. So therefore, we're going to see a shift in that uh, breakdown of the impacts by life cycle phase. We're going to see a much greater impact in the materials intensity and a much lower impact in the use phase. So therefore, in the future, we're going to have to see that second role of composites and advanced materials in reducing the footprint of the building itself and what it's made of and not necessarily that use phase. Uh, everything we're going to talk about here is predicated on studies using uh, a life cycle approach. Uh, it starts with raw material acquisition, the energy it takes to pump oil out of the ground, take limestone out of the ground to make cement, going through all the material processing, through the use phase, finally retirement recovery, drawing boundaries around all those things and measuring everything going in and everything coming out. Uh, this also leads me to a, a, a very, I think, a, a nuanced point of when we look at specific energy for materials, things like CO2 per pound or CO2 per cubic foot. Uh, those numbers have to be taken with a very large grain of salt because we don't use materials per pound. We don't use materials by cubic foot. We use materials in a specific geometry to carry a certain load or to provide a certain, uh, provide a certain service. They perform a function. And so therefore the comparison should not be made on volumetric bases or necessarily uh, area bases, unless the area is the function that you're trying to meet. So I have to be very careful in making those comparisons. Uh, so act one in the dual roles, the lower energy use. So this is a, a, a product um, that, uh, that I think Andreas is, is quite familiar with, uh, a panel light curtain wall. Uh, what it's designed to do is uh, take a honeycomb uh, aluminum uh, that's uh, encased in a, in a, I think, I believe it's a cast acrylic or cast polymer, and what it's intended to do is limit the amount of uh, sunlight that comes in through a curtain wall uh, to just those uh, sun rays that are essentially coming in at a horizontal angle, so you get no angled sun coming in. And so the effect is that you can see straight out, but it's tough to see on angles, but therefore it reduces the amount of sunlight coming in. Uh, in this case, the case study, full life cycle assessment, the functional unit was the cladding of a 30-year building here in LA. Uh, 200 by 200 uh, area footprint, 600 feet tall, 50 stories, model after 11 times square in New York, but actually put in this environment here. Uh, the inventory analysis, what it takes to actually make these panels, 
is shown up here on the, on the upper part of this graph, and then what it takes to take the materials and get them into the, uh, into the um, uh, panel shape is shown here, and we're seeing emissions of carbon dioxide and PM10, which leads to asthma and all kinds of other uh, carcinogens. All right. So then that's the, everything that brings us up to the use phase, and there's a very uh, complex uh, use phase model that looks at the dynamic solar heat gain based on the sun angle throughout the day, and then we do a model for every day of the year, looking at what the angles of the sun are to come up with the overall heat load on the building, uh, run a multi-physics model to see what we need to cool the building, and we can get total electrical use and total gas use over the, uh, over the uh, uh, year and then over the entire life cycle of the building. And so what we can come down to is a comparison between, say, a standard cladding, a standard window, uh, versus a panel light window. And from, in terms of all the emissions that we look at, uh, we see a lot of reductions by doing this. Why? Just because through the use of an advanced material, an advanced composite, uh, we're reducing solar heat gain. That brings down those use phases uh, quite quickly. Uh, uh, if you want to compare that to some other uh, technologies, like a fritted glass, whatever that might be, um, that you're going to compare it to, um, uh, it's not quite as good as something like a fritted glass, but that's not the look that you're going for. It's a different functional unit. Um, but you can see significant reductions. Now, overall what we find in this, in this uh, scenario is that it really doesn't matter. Oh, first of all, you want to try to limit, limit the transport. These are actually produced in Germany and then shipped over. Uh, to the United States, and, and uh, it tends to be a pretty big piece of the puzzle here. So uh, by limiting the supply chain, you can reduce the impact of your, of your uh, composites quite a bit. But the, the real salient point here is that it doesn't matter what material we use in this case for this analysis. This could be made out of pure energy. And because of the life cycle uh, accumulation of impacts for uh, this type of building, the use phase is everything. And so therefore, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to concentrate on the energy intensity of the material, as long as it affects the use phase, that will be a good investment in our energy and emissions resources. Then there are some other um, uh, conclusions on exactly where this would be most useful. It's quite good in equatorial temperate climates. Phoenix wasn't so great. Uh, and then also using it on the right uh, facades, those that will see sun. Uh, and then moving to something that's a lot less energy intensive to produce, but also not so quite impactful on the use phase as far as uh, solar heat gain goes on the other phases of the building. Uh, all lessons you can learn that are pinpointed by this, by this type of, of very quantitative analysis. So that was the first act, how to use an advanced composite to quantitatively reduce the use phase of a building, which is important now. That's really where we should be focused. But then in the, in the future, as we go forward, uh, we have to be concerned uh, with the uh, lowering the embodied energy of the materials in the structures. And so here I want to do another case study uh, looking at uh, two concert halls. Uh, one I think Bill had already mentioned. He's fabricating uh, the, uh, the, the panels uh, within the new Bing Concert Hall at Stanford. So he's fabricating these what are called sails uh, for the acoustical behavior of the, of the um, concert hall, and this is the second concert hall at, at, at RPI in which um, uh, we're comparing these acoustical panels to the uh, precast concrete panels at this auditorium here to see indeed if composites uh, play, can play a role in reducing the, uh, the uh, footprint, the, the environmental impact of, uh, of the structure. Uh, so these are some, uh, some dimensions on the structure here. Um, uh, 40 foot by 40 foot on these panels that, that Bill's making. I'm sure that's a, that's a distinct challenge, and the impact panels are a little bit smaller. Uh, but we'll get to what the functional unit of comparison is uh, in a little bit. The composition is incredibly important. So the Bing panels, uh, those that, are gonna, that, that Bill's producing, uh, have a, a covering of Bosflafon, a very thin layer of this acoustic, uh, acoustic coating, uh, 3 16 inch FRP, uh, backed by a one inch thick concrete layer to give it the uh, mass that it needs to serve as an acoustic panel, and a steel space truss behind it to, to take that free form 3D shape and fix it to it was essentially a, 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 a square structural frame. The impact panels are a four inch thick precast concrete material with steel angles on the back to hook it up to the, uh, to the structure. The functional unit in this case is one square foot of surface area. Right, not one pound of material, not one uh, kilogram of material, 
or one cubic foot of material, but rather the functional area, because we're trying to provide uh, square feet of acoustic material. Um, there is a very big assumption that both concert halls are designed with the same acoustic quality. That is the functional unit. If, in fact, they're not delivering the same uh, service level, then this is an unfair comparison. But uh, the acoustics in these two, uh, in these two are, are quite similar. So the environmental comparison in this case shows that the Bing panel performs significantly worse. This is the FRP panel, uh, performs significantly worse than the impact panel um, by about a 40% margin. And so we would say here, look, FRP is a bad decision. Right? But we want to go a little bit deeper than that. Why did this happen? Uh, we're looking at a thinner panel. We're looking at what we think is a, uh, might have been a better solution. Uh, so these are two emission impact, or excuse me, impact flow diagrams. And so at the top, you can see the overall impact of one square foot of material. And then we're going to break down uh, where all those impacts are actually accrued from in the production stage, in the fabrication stage, and in the delivery and transportation stage. So for the bin panels, most of the uh, impacts come from plywood forms uh, to make all these things, uh, and that steel space truss that's used to connect it to the building itself. Uh, the concrete and the FRP, this is actually the FRP portion right here, uh, is very small. Whereas for the impact panel, uh, the formwork tends to be big, but the concrete itself is the gorilla in the room. And so, the conclusion that we can get here is the FRP is not a bad decision, right? It's just the fact that you need this big steel space truss behind it. And so this really uh, makes an argument for uh, monocoque structures, right? Where you're actually using the FRP. In this case, it's not being used for its structural uh, ability at all in many regards, uh, but rather uh, if, if you designed it to actually take advantage of its structural uh, rigidity and load carrying capacity, you could get a much more efficient system and it gives us a chance to make very strategic decisions about the manufacturing process, the design process, to see quantifiable reductions uh, in impact, uh, which is really important uh, when it comes uh, to cost. So from this uh, study, the conclusions were the Bing panel system was more energy intensive, it was, had more environmental impacts, but the composite part was actually a pretty small piece, and the space trust was most of the impact. The recommendations that we made were maybe an alternative resin, a bio-based, wouldn't be bad, uh, reduce the material in the forms. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the final, uh, the final answer, uh, but it can be a very uh, useful recommendation. And definitely a modified support system or no support system uh, that makes full use of the, um, of the structural integrity of the panel itself rather than putting this big space frame behind it. Uh, so my, I guess my final thoughts and, and comments on all that was that advanced composites really present a dual role depending on how far out you're looking. Uh, today, uh, they really they can be leveraged very well to reduce energy use in architectural spaces. Uh, but in the future, thinking about them as a much bigger piece of the embodied portion uh, of energy within a building, um, as that becomes more, a, as we shift to more energy uh, efficient, or excuse me, efficient energy production, uh, that's going to become a very large, a large deal. We do need some proper tools to allow designers to look at these things at very early stage. And those are the kinds of things that we're working on uh, in my research, research group to integrate life cycle assessment, very quantitative analysis in early stage design. Lo um, and large opportunities do exist. And I want to go back to a, a comment that, um, that, that Evan made yesterday, and that this is not supposed to guide design, right? This is informational at best. And it's done to support the design effort that architects are making but is not supposed to be the uh, end-all arbiter of architecture. That's a very poor idea because it completely devalues the worth of creativity and good design. Uh, a few other projects that uh, I thought might be of interest that we can, I certainly could have discussed, but uh, for time reasons, because I'm now two minutes, um, uh, couldn't discuss. So uh, this was some work uh, that, uh, that Kevin Daly proposed um, uh, on some sustainable urban residences using a. Um, innovative materials and comparing those to uh, reinforced concrete. I believe this was work that was done here at, at, at SciArc by, by Patrick, um, comparing a foam structure to a reinforced concrete structure, once again, trying to see what is the advantage of, of advanced materials uh, compared to traditional materials. Um, this one was talked about before, the, uh, the Cultural Center in Baku, Azerbaijan, in which case we found that uh, FRP panels were far better than a limestone uh, 
comparison that, that a limestone panel that uh, was used, being used for the skin. Um, in more kind of say, well, may say mundane construction, the replacement of reinforced concrete foundations with pre-manufactured or prefabricated uh, FRP foundations. This work was sponsored by a big resin producer, Ashland Chemical, um, and we can see in nearly every every circumstance uh, that advanced materials certainly have a big role to play in um, in in reducing the environmental impacts of of architecture. Uh, a little bit more on the on the panel light looking. Um, uh, looking at the use of, of composites and advanced materials to replace um, just internal uh, dividing walls, glass dividing walls for meeting rooms and things. That can be a very strong argument there as well. And then, of course, I don't really do any of this work myself. Um, I should thank Stanford for money. Um, Panelite and Chrysler and Associates for the, the use of their case studies. Um, the project teams that help with um, that help with these studies, uh, and if anybody's interested in having one of these studies done, please contact me. We do them with my students every fall, and then the graduate students who do the real work. So that's all I had. I think I'm on time. All right, good deal. Uh, I'm showing design work. I'm a, I'm a designer, not an engineer, although around SciArc, a lot of people consider me to be the engineer, but um, now you'll, you'll realize that I'm, in fact, um, an interloper. Uh, okay, so I want to start with a kind of an overview of things that I'm interested in which have led me to an interest in composites. It was not the other way around. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in uh, well, in the, state of, in the state of affairs now in architecture, which is the way that building systems almost never operate together, that they're delivered by various contractors that are not working in unison although that is beginning to change, and that there's no thought to the, um, the, the cooperation, uh, um, uh, um, not in terms of optimizing building systems, but the cooperation that can happen between building systems, including envelope, uh, heating, ventilation, structure, lighting, um, those, all of those building systems, what kinds of architectural effects they can have when you start to unify them in different ways. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time looking at, um, at, at the way those things can happen. Again, not in search of efficiency, but actually um, in, in search of architectural effects, although sometimes you do find latent efficiencies in these kinds of organizations. Um, so here's a couple of sketches that, that we do in the office um, looking at the difference between a kind of trabeated structure on the upper left where you have a, a clear uh, primary system, secondary system, and then some kind of floor um, and starting to try to combine uh, uh, the movement of air and, um, and a structural system through pleating in the, in the case of the red, the red version and then other versions where you take a, a structural system and hybridize it, like in the purple one where you maybe take something that's uh, got a shell type and begin to locally um, uh, hybridize it where it might begin to take on a, a vector type in, um, in local areas. Um, uh, at the same time being driven by um, uh, by an interest in the crossover between things that can be structural but are also ornamental, like Evan was talking about last night, um, and not really knowing where one uh, begins and ends, which is an interest of mine. Uh, um, I like very much armor, um, uh, the Roman armor in the middle, where you've got um, uh, something which is clearly doing both. It's str uh, stiffening the, the, the plate material through pleating, but it's also got an ornamental logic. Um, uh, also, the, the suit on the left from Dune, the movie Dune, uh, uh, for Arrakis Desert Planet, um, a really fabulous combination of, of, um, of uh, a hydronic system, recycling hydronic system, and, um, and surfaces that also start to fuse in some areas, which is something that I try to do in some of my projects. Uh, I want to show a couple of prototypes and a couple of projects, and then also a project uh, that we're doing at SciArc. Uh, this is a, a prototype called, uh, I don't know what's wrong with the slide, it's called Thermostrut. It's a, it's a crossover project. It's not all, it's, the structure is not all fiber composite. It's got a steel, a steel uh, a beam structure with fiber composite on top of it. The intention, though, is to also embed in it a solar thermal system. So these are, um, there's a solar thermal system that, that is sometimes winding through the structure and other times um, uh, embedded into the surface of it so that you get, you get a kind of tattooing effect um, and a gradient color effect that goes from, from the solar thermal tubes, which are black, um, uh, and then fades that or feathers that back in, into, the, uh, into the rest of the, the structure. This is another prototype uh, called lizard skin based on the agamid lizard which collects water on its back through these channels and it never has to drink because the water is constantly channeling from its back into its mouth. Um, uh, uh, so taking the ridging from the, from the, uh, the lizard 
and turning it into a hybrid um, algae bioreactor slash uh, gray water recapture system. So you can, um, you can use this as a, as a roof or a leaning facade where you can, again, you can capture, um, I don't have a pointer here, yes I do. Uh, you can capture water in these channels, and at the same time, these elements here are, are to be transparent and contain um, algae in order, uh, in order uh, to generate biofuel. Um, there are the two different systems that are interwoven. Uh, there's the algae system and there's the water on the, on the underbelly of it. And you can see on the bottom what happens when you combine those two systems is you get a, um, a, third, a third emerging system, which is structural capacity. The upper cord of these, of these trusses are, uh, uh, contain algae and the lower cord water, and then by connecting them you start to get structural stiffness. Another one uh, called tracery glass, which is playing off of stained glass and uh, beginning to think about how we could embed technology into polycarbonate surfaces in a way that, um, that is uh, ornamental but also doing work um, and also kind of disturbing the, trans the pure transparency of glass, or in this case polycarbonate. And um, so it has a, um, embedded in it, it's, uh, they're actually bubbles, and uh, so it can capture heat inside of the bubble. There are, um, uh, uh, there's a cooling system inside which can remove the heat from the air that gets captured in the bubbles. And there's also a solar PV system, thin film system, which is embedded. And again, there's color being used to kind of um, degrade the independence of those systems and, and create coherency. Uh, there's a picture of the model. This is a multi-material 3D print uh, with these elements embedded in the, in the glass. Another one, um, this one's called Batwing, comes out of looking at ceilings, a lot of ceilings and fixtures and hardware that we find in architectural ceilings and trying to think about an alternative to that, uh, um, especially diffusers. And um, this is the proposal. It's, it's something that tries to combine uh, structural stiffness through pleating in a surface, but also through double delamination, you get air hollows, uh, hollows where you can transport air through surfaces. Um, so you've got your, uh, you've got your uh, mechanical systems in there. And then at the same time, um, uh, l potential lighting effects with translucency, but also microcapillaries, which are running across these air delivery systems so that you can heat and cool locally. You're not heating and cooling at the source. You're heating and cooling at the, uh, at the moment where you're um, releasing the air into the space. So that's a kind of reversible system, heating and cooling. Oh, here's a a prototype of that, um, it's actually made out of solid blocks of ABS milled um, uh, in China, so, uh, and it's missing some detail, but, um, but it was a kind of a form model. And one important thing, too, um, were what I call these, um, these uh, metaseams. A metaseam is something that's enabled through fiber composites, which is a seam which isn't necessarily um, uh, uh, related to, let's say, a material limit that comes from industry, like when you're dealing with glass or metal or, thing, or sheet metal, which come in, you know, like metal, let's say, maximum 1 meter 50 th uh, widths, and then, let's say, glass 250 maximum, maybe a little larger. Um, in this, in the case with fiber composites, you can do much larger pieces, and you can freeform where the seams are um, uh, based usually only on how you're going to get the pieces to the site unless they're manufactured on site. Uh, there's the underbelly of one of the pieces of that. Um, quick project, this is an art project, uh, public art project for the Department of Cultural Affairs in LA just down the street from the Standard Hotel. Um, talking to the people at Origin Oil, uh, uh, Riggs Eckleberry there, um, Origin Oil is, a, is an algae bioreactor company in LA um, uh, with really interesting technology where they've, they've now enabled um, uh, the process to go 24 hours a day, first through the use of, of, uh, of, um, of fluorescent lights, but now controlled LED um, LED systems that will actually re respond to the growth of the algae colonies. So, um, so I proposed an, uh, a kind of algae aquarium that uh, um, that what works 24 hours a day and is driven by um, by these tree monkey um, uh, solar panels winding up this tree. It's a very strange small site, and the um, uh, uh, the the interior is made out of um, uh, of molded acrylic and also a lot of um, milled acrylic and contains all of the, all the apparatuses and all, all of that required to filter out the, um, the lipids, which is the oil, from the algae colonies. And so um, at night you get an effect kind of like fireflies, this thing animates, um, uh, which uh, reveals um, that, the, that the algae is in fact uh, growing and photosynthesizing even at night. 
Um, this project is a tower uh, which uh, um, was in China. It's not going to be built. Um, the idea of, of the tower is to um, completely reinvent the mechanical system and make that a, one driver of the, of the form of the project. Uh, getting rid of a conventional mechanical system and starting to uh, starting to use the mechanical system also as a primary structure, super column system that's also able to take lateral, and um, and uh, at the same time have extremely long ducts so that you get the stack effect, which will suck the hot air out of the building, and at the same time take um, what you'd normally have on the roof, a condenser for uh, heat exchange, and uncoil that thing across the facades um, to create a kind of gigantic skin, uh, skin heat exchange device. So there's some details of that guy. Marcelin, how am I doing? OK, good. This is a project in Taipei. It was a competition for the, um, the Taipei Performing Arts Center. And um, uh, which we lost. And the idea was to locate locate theaters on either end of the site based on the brief, and we ended up making a kind of a bridging structure in between the two and a large plaza underneath. And um, and at the same time, we created these huge involutions underneath the belly of the project, um, which would become a kind of elevated urban space hanging above a, a, a plaza. At the same time, a concourse that would connect these theaters together. And uh, um, this is the concourse. And I, sh I show you because of the, 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 um, the belly of the project is actually the main facade of the project. And um, again, using um, color and capillaries, this time at a much larger scale, um, uh, um, as a way of starting to create almost urban space. Uh, OK. So this guy, um, located on the water, looks like it crawled out of the water, I know. Um, it's, uh, this is a fiber composite piece with, um, uh, um, it was for the Yosu Expo 2012. It was a competition as well. It's intended that it's made out of milled foam um, that become lost molds uh, where you, um, you, you use fiber composite on either side of it to make the hard parts. And the soft parts um, are membranes, which, uh, which I'm calling uh, boom brains, which is basically a combination of an air boom. Uh, these again are double delaminations. In this, in this, uh, in this case, filled with air, so pressurized booms embedded into a membrane, so that it doesn't sag. Uh, but at the same time, we have some structural members that are there to kind of stabilize it to keep it from uh, jiggling and moving around. Um, there you see the different the different systems there. So. Um, I think I'll fast forward through, well, maybe I'll show this. This is um, a pavilion done some years ago. It was a, also a competition. This one we won, and they were, uh, um, apparently there was a construction manager looking at it after the jury and decided that it, this was impossible to build. Um, this was four years ago. And um, I guess uh, after hearing what I've been hearing today, I think uh, maybe in the next few years we'll be there. Um, uh, the, the idea of the project was to have um, a pattern which could both respond to the curvature in surface, um, uh, um, but also to a kind of an, an overall patterning logic, which would, um, well, I guess where it's the most flat, you have massive cells, which again are much larger than any kind of known material. Uh, so this is not a panelization scheme. This is actually an ornamental uh, metaseme project. Um, but at the same time, it is responding to the curvature at these two large column-like elements that uh, run down the middle of the piece um, and create stability and, uh, and structure. Uh, okay. So this is a project that I'm doing with my students, and I, I don't know uh, if they're here. I, if you guys are, I hope you're, anyway. Um, I'm doing it with my students uh, in the context of materials lab, which is an applied studies uh, um, uh, uh, program. Uh, where we basically spend the fall designing something based on a material logic and other agenda uh, items that someone might have, and then we build it in the spring. In this case, we're building it in the summer. Um, we started with a, a, an, an, a soft kill algorithm um, called solid thinking, 
And uh, basically, if you don't know what so soft kill is, it, it's basically an algorithm that takes a base shape like this or this, and it begins to remove the material where it doesn't need it, but also it redistributes material where it might need it. Um, and we use that as, as one element in a kind of game where we were looking both at, um, at, at structural soft kill, but at the same time at the material logic of fiber composites in order to inform one another. Because, of course, so this soft kill uh, uh, algorithm knows nothing about manufacture or materials. So uh, the interest one minute. So the interest of ours was to was to combine the, the results of this um, uh, a formal sensibility uh, that was linked to fiber composites. So there's a there's the guy that we went with after uh, hundreds of versions. And uh, we worked with Happold, Burrow Happold, on some uh, ANSYS analysis of the surface. This is a, a, a very chunky model where we, we began to understand where it might uh, it might have some buckling issues. And this is a piece of the physical model. Uh, um, uh, we have the large physical model actually right outside the room here, uh, where you start to see the the emergence of um, of some some uh, some pleats. Uh, on the project, in, in particular in response to areas where we had large open surfaces which were beginning to buckle. Um, so it's systematic, uh, but at the same time, not everywhere. In other words, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between solving a problem um, uh, uh, and, um, or, or let's say, making visual the solution of a problem, but it's also a kind of instinctual or sen uh, uh, aesthetic sensibility kind of, kind of approach. So it's both, and it's both in one. Uh, so. So there's the piece um, and its language. And one thing I was saying to Marcelin before that I'm, uh, I, uh, that I'm really interested in is that we thought at first that these pleats would be good locations for panel seams, um, and then realized later that, again, that the panel seams could be completely freed from, uh, from those locations. And in fact, structurally, it makes a lot more sense to cut it in a completely different way um, uh, that has nothing to do with those, those uh, seams. So, I'll just wrap up with uh, a couple of quick images of some projects I've been, um, I'm uh, hopefully, hopefully going to build. Um, there's that. Uh, the, the first one I show for one reason only. Um, this is a sports complex in Shenyang, China. And um, I, I began it uh, with the idea of having um, a large uh, um, double DLAM, almost bulkhead-like structural beams in the roof. And the thing that you uh, realize the minute you get into, uh, the minute you scale something up like a small prototype to the scale of this thing, which is quite large, um, uh, you, th this is the, the interior of it. And you can see some of these, these pleats, which are active on the interior and the top as well. And then you get to um, dealing with uh, local technology and limits and, uh, and also just, uh, frankly, economy. Um, and you start to have to break down what was a surface structure or thought of as a surface structure um, into a vector a vector structure. Um, uh, although those things are still housing this building services, um, they are trusses. Um, so that's the current status of that project. And then the last one I wanted to show, because um, I was mentioning to Bill Chrysler last night on the roof of the Standard Hotel, and he had a great idea for it. Um, this is a hotel in Beijing, uh, also quite a large project. And um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's basically a, a series of three rings with hotels that look, can look either towards the interior of the hotel or towards the outside. And it's got a, um, it's got a very, very lightweight skin on it. Um, uh, and um, it's got a rainforest inside. The client wants a, a gigantic rainforest inside. So, um, so w what I'm working on right now is the skin of the thing, how to keep it extremely lightweight. Uh, it, it will also be embedded with solar thermal on the exterior, which is exciting. The client was very excited about that. Um, it's also under a lot of pressure, a lot of strain here because of condensation and, and, and liquids and all that all over it because of the, the, um, uh, the rainforest. And so anyway, uh, um, just, thinking, just thinking out loud with, with Bill last night, he had the idea of using a kind of uh, low-tech um, rattan type movable mold where the panels could be produced for this uh, very quickly um, and the mold you don't have to throw away but you can uh, you can um, keep adjusting it and producing panels for it. Uh, I think with that um, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to thank all three of you for a really inspiring um, set of presentations. As I anticipated, I think we um, sort of looked at performance and uh, notions of environment in, in several different ways. 
Um, I'd also like to uh, refer back to something that Evan brought up in the keynote last night. Um, a couple of issues, one being the transmutation of matter um, that I think all three of you addressed, um, especially, uh, well, Michelle talking about that as a kind of material behavior um, that produces certain effects when material starts to capture other materials. So when, when air or water or algae um, start to be contained within the surface. Um, and, and those things begin to act in concert with one another and touch on structural performance, environmental performance, and also something I think that's of interest to many people in the room, uh, being as we are architects, um, the kind of design performance in terms of producing architectural effects. So I guess what I'd like to do is maybe go around and um, just ask each of you how you think these kind of, uh, both the transmutation of matter and the, the intricacy, how those are uh, impacting uh, contemporary design sensibility. I mean, Mike, you spoke, you specifically mentioned good design. So I guess I would start there maybe and say, what do you think <laughs> constitutes um, that definition of good design? I was totally gonna let Michelle go first. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do I think constitutes good design? You're asking a person who's not a designer. Um, so for, from my point of view, it has to be a, a design that takes that life cycle approach, right? You can't get down into the minutia at the start of the design process. You have to take it from the standpoint of uh, appreciating that if you're really going to design for an environmental target, which in my case is the metric for a good design, um, you, ha you have to start with a very broad point of view. And without that, the answer you're going to get, the solution you come up with, is not going to be anywhere close to optimal. And uh, I, I guess for me that would be the process you would use to come up with a good design. Um, like I said, being an engineer, I'm not a designer. And so uh, I think that's a, that's a tough question for me to... Mm -hmm. To answer. Thanks for throwing that one That's out first. Right That's out. good. I like but that. I, I mean, I'd be, I'd be curious yeah. what, um, in what ways you think that that can be, you know, generative for for, for design. Because it, yeah. it, I always hear life cycle yeah. in relation to anal uh, analysis or post analysis of something that exists mm -hmm. to find out, you know, did we did we make the right decision yeah. or did we blow it or, um, you know. But um, I guess I'd just be curious what. Yeah. How, how, how do we do that? Well, so right now we're looking at some very neat tools. Uh, the, the, the approach has to be an, an, a software approach, right, in, in which uh, we're now using faster algorithms, better data sets in order to do, and, 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 the, and the linking of BIM models and, 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 uh, and, and design tools with lifecycle assessment software to get very quick feedback and essentially zero lag time on environmental assessment of designs. So. Uh, as a designer, you come up with whatever shape or form you're interested in. Uh, you could even do it through a, a generative design approach in which you put in a seed design and we can use genetic algorithms to come up with, with uh, whatever uh, shape might be. Uh, get an instant return uh, for feedback and allow you to move forward um, with, with a better design. And so it's, it's reducing that lag time during the iterative design process, which we are currently horrible at doing. Uh, in many cases, you skip over generations or tens of generations of design uh, uh, in, within design uh, before you do any kind of analysis like this. And that shouldn't be the case because you want that feedback as much as possible. And that's, the, we, we can, we can, we're now starting to get to the point where we can address that through uh, software solutions. Uh -huh. Michelle, <laughs> would you like to? Do, do I have to answer the good design question? <laughs> <laughs> Not an easy no, one, I mean, is I, it? I think really, well, it's an issue of, it, it, it also relates back to something uh, that was brought up on the previous panel by Hernan, the, the sort of um, liberation. Like now that, you know, everyone's talking about the liberation of certain constraints, um, you know, things that become scalable uh, over, you know, radical shifts um, that no longer you know, we, I mean, as Tom's addressing the meta seam as well, that there are basically the, the main constraint for that is um, getting materials to the site 
uh, rather than you know the fabrication process itself. So I guess the question really starts to become okay. You know, with this sort of liberty, um, what are maybe the uh, sort of resistances that begin to that we begin to work with in a in a creative and productive way to generate new architectural effects? Um, mm. Yeah, so barriers to entry. There you go, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was was thinking on what you mentioned at, as you, you opened this when you were talking about or referring back to uh, transmutation, and I think it, it, it leads from this this uh, the, this this uh, most recent comment that you made. You know, I did share any of my own work uh, today. I was just showing some of the work of, of my doctoral students, but. Uh, the, the thing that I do and the thing I'm most interested in is this, you know, manipulation of behavior as opposed to a manipulation, you know, of material. And for example, we think about conductivity uh, in a, a material, conductivity in a, in a wall material or glazing, and we presume that means conduction, whereas a conductivity is a property of the material, but it actually is not what determines conduction. You know, it's the other characteristics that determine conduction. Yet we spend all of our time dealing with the material property as if it's the driver. And so, you know, I can take a single pane of glazing and have it behave if it's a thick insulated wall simply by manipulating the behavior near it with a resistance wire. Yet we don't do that. You know, we, we want the, the property, the material, the behavior to sort of all be neatly wrapped up into one. And I, 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 I love Tom's work, and I, I've always loved Tom's work, um, but I've always been interested in sort of pulling apart a lot of those different phenomena, particularly environmental systems like heating and cooling, that as long as we think about them as being integrated with structure, integrated with form, and um, you know, de facto, a building system as opposed to a series of different phenomena that, that exist only for the human body, I think that we actually don't move forward very quickly. We have beautiful form, there's no question. I think from a good design standpoint, I would rather be Tom than me, there's, there's no question. <laughs> but um, as long as we do see it as part of architectural form, I actually think we're holding ourselves back and really pushing forward some of these uh, behaviors. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I guess I, I think um, one, one thing I would be really interested in, uh, in regards to some of the things you spoke about in your talk is, is uh, in particular, uh, magic. I, I like the idea that you can um, begin to integrate technology into architecture uh, in a way that is magical and you can't find the source of it, and you can do multiple things at once without um, having identification with particular building systems. I guess it's the kind of, for, for me, that's sort of what you're talking about. When you liberate and the idealism of associating a material um, with a behavior, and you say behavior can begin to be multiple, and it can cross, and you can begin, begin to cross behaviors um, within materials, uh, I, think, I, I think that's a, that's a huge area of, of, of um, of possibility right now in architecture, and I, I just I think that um, uh, one trick's going to be obsolescence. I think about that one a lot. Um, what happens when you know when you're working with the cutting edge cutting edge technology, and then in five years that's not the cutting edge anymore, and things are in fact embedded in a way that you can't unwind them anymore, um, uh, presents a problem. Presents yeah, a problem. I think that's why I've always been interested in sort of discrete. Uh, disintegrated systems that sort of allow that turnover not to be all connected together, but that it could almost happen continuously that something was always turning over mm -hmm. uh, and developing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right. With regard to your point of, of um, barriers, and I thought you brought up a really good one in, in, in the fact that we've deconstructed buildings to be individual systems, and and the in the idea that uh, they can be a very integrated system is is really difficult because of design professions and trade unions and, and the way that, that buildings are constructed today in that they are very piecemeal and different folks, uh, they've, they've gotten so specialized uh, that it takes years of education uh, to just design one little piece of it and, um, and, and th that's a good thing yeah. and, and, and a bad thing. Yeah. I, 
it's so true. And actually, one of my best experiences in um, in building something was uh, on this project that I did for uh, for Wolf Pricks, the BMW World project. Um, where when we contracted it, it was a design assist model, and when we contracted it, we actually chopped it into pieces and gave the whole front part of the building to one contractor, all the systems. And it was, it was really amazing the things that we can do. We can do. And in fact, for the, for the front of that building, we were able to integrate a hydronic system into all of the structure and do all kinds of things like that, where usually liability would, uh, just liability alone, mm -hmm. much less uh, interest in cooperation, much less, um, you know, other issues, coordination issues, uh, would normally keep you from doing that. And so, I, I mean, I, I like the, uh, the chunk model of making architecture where you actually, uh, you, know, you have to have more, more skill sets interrelated um, uh, and maybe, you know, buildings are chunked rather than layered. I don't, I don't know how and how to make that happen, but I just... And from the standpoint of three about. academics sitting up here, how, do, how in the world do we teach that? I have no idea what, um, what, what curriculum would look like in order to allow someone to do that. Or if it's even responsible. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's really, really a tough question. Yeah. Well, I think it also you know, brings up notions of the environment or the milieu. I mean, everything that you guys are talking about, both in the integrated model and the disintegrated model um, that Michelle is, is talking about, uh, both start to suggest that, you know, again, the conference theme, uh, material beyond materials, that the behavior of these materials and the material systems um, start to have an impact or a, a fall off that's larger than the kind of um, physical uh, structure itself. So that that begins to, you know, impact the uh, local microclimates in the building or around the building. Um, that possibly then starts to have a very uh, profound architectural effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, 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 I think that's, that's super interesting when you can leap out of one regime, let's say, of the visual, and where your thing's operating at that level, but you can also, you know, it can also be doing other kinds of work that are unexpected, you know, uh, um, at, atmospheric work, thermal work, um, you know, other kinds of work as well. Um, I, uh, I, that's, that would be one of my biggest interests. Although, you know, it's, it's interesting how difficult it is for us to do that. You know, that, uh, you know, we expect behavior and we expect form to be didactic. And the, the fact is that a lot of the active phenomena, particularly like the thermal phenomena, are anything but intuitive. We think they're intuitive. They're actually quite counterintuitive. And so how is it that we take action whereby we make this physical thing uh, yet with that physical thing, you know, are and is embedded a whole series of sort of other ki types of behaviors. Now we just sort of hope that by assigning the physical thing a certain sort of quality that those behaviors will be, uh, be sort of named and assigned along mm -hmm. with it, but they indeed are not. And that's where I think um, the issue that you brought up, Tom, of the kind of tattooing and coloration that comes along with the introduction of some of these systems where water um, and algae, when they start to be kind of channeled through the surface, begin to interact with other kinds of decisions, the design decisions in terms of the application of color and how that can be enhanced by the presence of those uh, kind of biodynamic um, materials. Yeah, and, and, and in that way it's a kind of a... Um it's like an ecology where you know you n no one system is maybe at, at its at its optimum, but uh, they're all working at good, you know at a level of being good enough. I guess uh, that's I think that's a good place to be. You know. Audience, do you, do we have time for an audience question? No. Okay, <laughs> sorry, audience. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, right. Thanks. Thank you, Marcel. Awesome.